Um, okay, well, why don't we get started? Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today uh, for a myth-busting event around the female orgasm. Uh, there are so many myths out there around orgasm, around whether it be when it happens, when it doesn't happen, how often it should happen, all kinds of uh, just things that we're told by the media and society. So I am really excited for our speakers to set the record straight. Um, just as a quick reminder, we will be recording this session and we'll share it out with anyone who um, who's registered afterwards. So if you have to hop off, no worries, you'll get a recording of this. Um, and we got a couple of questions in advance that I'll uh, make sure to just pepper into the conversation for you guys as well. Um, and just a little bit of context on, on origin and us. Um, we are physical therapy with a focus on the pelvic floor and the whole body and really believe that this kind of care should be accessible for everyone. Um, so are providing that virtually across Texas, California, and New York, and are in network with most major commercial insurers. So really excited to kick off this discussion. I'll just introduce our two speakers and let them do most of the talking because they're the experts. Um, so first up, we have uh, Dr. UC, um, who is the founder of UC Logic which is a judgment-free social media platform dedicated to sex education and the empowerment of adults, or as she likes to call them, grown folk, which I love. Um, and when it comes to sexual intelligence, sex education, Dr. Yusi is really just the um, epitome of truth and just always really real and authentic and kind in her approach. And so we're so excited to have her lead this discussion. Um, and we also have Dr. Ashley <laughs> Rollins, who is a physical therapist with Origin, and she is based out of Dallas and leads our virtual physical therapy team, specializes in the pelvic floor um, and pelvic pain discussion or dysfunction, and just um, we are so excited to have her on the team. And with that, I will turn it over to UC to kick things off. Hi everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us here in this, you know, early evening discussion. I have my little libation right here um, just so we can like, you know, chat about sexy time, particularly orgasm when it comes to women and vulva owners. And so Ashley and I wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a background uh, first before we jump into the myths, but this is supposed to be, you know, a nice, easy flowing discussion. So please jump in with your questions. There's no perfect time. There's no perfect time to ask. It's all just just ask as it comes to you and we will pause and chat it out and talk it out because that's that's why we're here. Yeah. So a great time. Next slide. Thank you. So I just and I didn't I meant to say, it's I meant to type bell hooks, not belly hooks. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I love belly hooks. I was, thinking, I was thinking belly breathing. It's <laughs> like a new brand. At the same time. So <laughs> I apologize. This is a bell hooks, not belly hooks. No, that's not their nickname either. It's just bell hooks. <laughs> but um, they said women will only be truly sexually liberated when we arrive at a place where we can see ourselves as having sexual value and agency irrespective of whether or not we are objects of male desire. And I think that that can be applied to all people with desire. So we are not necessarily the object of another person's you know, sexual desire. We are in and, in and of itself, our own sexual human being. And that is the part that really needs to be developed and encouraged. And that's how we should actually start to frame our sexual functioning. Because oftentimes a lot of the distress, and we're going to talk about this, that we see people experience when it comes to sexual dysfunction is not necessarily in themselves, but then based on their partner or how other people will perceive them. And that's where a lot, for a lot of individuals, that's where a big bulk of their distress comes from. Next slide. So we're just going to chat about, you know, some things, some primers, you know, before we jump into the myths, you know, what... What do we really need to kind of think about when we're thinking about sexual dysfunction? So the orgasm factor. So let's just get this out of the way. So there was a study done about three years ago where they looked at the orgasm in, you know, and they looked at this on the binary. So we're looking at cisgender individuals, um, but they looked at cisgender hetero men, gay cis men, and bisexual cis men. And they found that like, you know, as we're seeing hetero cis men about 95% of the time, they were orgasming, which is really great. Congratulations to them. 
Um, and then, you know, gay cis men were, were down a little bit, but not necessarily clinically significant to 89%. And then you see a little bit of a difference with bisexual cis men. So how many people think, how many, what percentage does anyone think that it dropped for, for hetero cis women? Does anyone want to put that in the chat? It's a great question. A lot. 25%. 25%. A lot. 40%. All right. All right. All right. I like it. I like it. Anybody else? Ooh, okay. Yeah. Uh, All right. So let's let's take a look. Ooh. So not as not as bad as we thought, but still it dropped a lot. So we're for heteros, for hetero cis women, it's 65%, down from Oh gosh, I even 95. 95%. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a 30% decrease. Cisgender, bisexual women, 66%. And then of course, 86% of lesbian cis women were able to achieve orgasm at that frequency. Right? And so yeah. this, this whole discussion when we're thinking about this orgasm gap um, really can be a whole, it can be a whole course. <laughs> on this, uh, but for the purposes of time and for what we're trying to talk about today, I will say that one of the factors they thought about, they talked about when it comes to why we're seeing this discrepancy is really about agency, sociocultural factors and expectations about sex and communication. So that seemed to be part of it, right? So when we're seeing it, especially when you're looking at the difference between lesbian women and uh, uh, heterosexual women, you know, they're talking about the communication is a little bit different and how sex is negotiated, how sex is perceived and how it's approached. Even in the mental, the sexual scripts we have in our head are a little bit different. And so that's going to kind of transpose into what we're seeing there. So some of you are incredibly familiar with the biopsychosocial model and some of you are not. And so I'm just going to briefly talk about this because this is how I have my patients, I have my clients, myself. This is how I have people looking at sex. This is how we should be looking at our health in general, but particularly our sexual health. So you wanna think of it as if from a biological construct, psychological, sociocultural, and interpersonal. So a lot of us are used to this biomedical model of thinking, okay, well, you know, I'm, I can't orgasm, so it must be that my pelvic floor is weak, and it must be that I have low estrogen or high, low te or high, high testosterone, low testosterone. There has to be a biological reason why this is occurring. Right. And then all the other factors, we all kind of just skirt away and just be like, OK, well, I'll deal with that later. But I really just need to get my shot of testosterone to boost everything. Right. And so and so that is an incomplete. I'm not telling people that it's wrong, but it's an incomplete picture of how we need to be looking at our orgasm, our sexual function in general, but particularly the orgasm, because your orgasm is part of the experience experiment excuse me, part of the experience of sexual activity. It's not the experience, right? So it's one of those things that occurs along the path of your sexy time exploration. So as we look at orgasm, it's not a measure of good sex, but it can be an indicator of what's going on, not just in your biological body, but your psychological body, right? Your performance anxiety, your stress, your trauma, your depression, What's going on socioculturally? So when we're thinking about socioculturally, we're thinking about our gender identity, our race, right? How we grew up, our religious beliefs, shame, right? All of those things. I mean, those. I mean, those aren't even microaggressions. Those are like macroaggressions on a level that I think people underestimate because they manifest themselves into upregulation of all of their stress hormones upregulation of all of those dorsal root reflexes in our, in our spine that make us a little bit more sensitive to pain and make us a little less responsive to sexy time, pleasurable touch. And we also have to remember that when we're thinking about our orgasm or our sexual functioning, our brains operate in this like accelerator brake system. So for example, this year has been a little stressful. Mm. Uh. <laughs> okay. All, like, all Understatement of the year, yeah. Go right? ahead. <laughs> I mean, so how many people have been hitting the brakes when it comes to like stress, anxiety, like everyone's a little maxed out. And depending on the person, 
right? If your brain is constantly on that break mode, it's hard for you to perceive any type of sexual stimuli in a positive sense, or those accelerators have been suppressed so much that your brake system is just on overload. Ashley, do you have anything to add on this? Well, and like I was thinking about even like what Joan was saying in the chat, it, you know, you do to, in the sociocultural component, we grow up with this like, we're almost like inundated with this whole idea of what orgasms and sex in general should be, you know, growing up with all these rom-coms and when it doesn't fit that picture, it just layers on to a whole another amount of, of shame and like what's wrong with me and complicates it even further. So you're right. It is, it's hard growing up and it need, you need to reframe that. It, the, our culture needs to be reframed from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, that's what I to say. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I think the rom-cons are a perfect example, no matter what identity, sexual orientation you are, race, all of that. Rom-coms are all the, basically the movies and, you know, videos and like growing yeah. up as kids, like I forget, like where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Like all the things that we watched <laughs> yeah. kind of had this like patriarchal concept about like gender, sex, sexuality, and those were like silent educators for us over the years. Yeah. And like, it's not like our parents sit down and explicitly talk to us about pleasure, orgasm, sex, right. all of that. I mean, except for my crazy Nigerian mother, but that's like- <laughs> Oh, I love your mother. <laughs> that's an outlier, but like, but she didn't even get into real detail. And so being able to navigate your orgasm solo or in a partnered or grouped scenario um, isn't yeah. something that we actually have been practically taught. Right. We've inferred from all of the things that we've been seeing. So that that was a great point. Um, yeah. yeah and, and to your point about accelerators and brakes, one of the best books I've read is the Come As You Are book by yeah. Emily yeah. Nagoski. And uh, I mean, that changed my life in <laughs> understanding yeah. those different pieces. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think that like Dr. Nagoski, like, basically blew everyone's tops off, uh, no pun intended, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's perfect <laughs> with, with that book, because she framed it in a way that was so digestible for us. Mm -hmm. No one has ever been that explicit and clear about how our systems are working. Yeah. And then also into this inner, oh, sorry, back to, uh, yeah. to the interpersonal component. Um, I think it's also super, super important for us to remember that when we're thinking about our relationships, it's not just our relationships with other people, but it's our relationship with ourselves. Yeah. So if you're going through a time in your life where think you're really on the struggle bus, whether that's because of pelvic floor issues, chronic pain, just general struggle bus, you know, this is a factor that can really impact your ability to experience an orgasm that is satisfying. Right. Postpartum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So and how, how long does postpartum last, Ashley? Oh, man. I don't know how I have a four year old and I, yeah. <laughs> I think it's still going. I right? mean, I think we we give our I think the the medical model doesn't give us nearly enough credit or um, preparation for what is to come in the, the postpartum period and how long that that lasts. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, technically they're saying the fourth trimester lasts about 24 months, but the thing is for some people, it's longer than that, just sure. depending on what's going on in their lives and what, you know, if they have another child, it's like that. Right. Next slide. Um, before I get into the orgasm stuff, does anyone have any questions or thoughts that they want to add? They take a sip of my drink. <laughs> <laughs> I just, on that postpartum, I, the one, a great line I heard was, you know, pregnancy is nine months and postpartum is forever, which I just <laughs> really resonated with all of the moms that I've talked to. <laughs> well, it is. I mean, cause it's not just, you know, it's, it's also like looking at it from like a, a body perspective. I mean, sure, you know, there's a lot of our hormones stabilize and tissues kind of um, go back to, you know, near where they were and things are, are starting to kind of 
be a little bit better from that perspective. But, you know, oftentimes there are still lingering dysfunctions, still, you know, muscle issues that haven't been healed or injuries. And um, it all kind of plays into, you know, you know, how your organs are and where, how that plays into your sexual function and orgasm abilities and, or how you're perceiving yourself. And it just, it's, it is forever for a lot of, in a lot of ways, um, or for a long time anyways, <laughs> certainly the, our children are there forever, Oops. but the, you know, the body effects, the, the, the healing can occur much, much, much longer than those two years. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Little technical glitch. Yeah. Um, so here, you know, this is the definition. One of the one of the many definitions of orgasm disorder or orgasm dysfunction. And all of you all can specifically read, but I think it's important to understand here where they're talking about persistent or recurrent delay in absence of or of orgasm following normal sexual excitement phase. So what does that mean exactly? So there is something called the biological um, female sexual model that was created by Masters and Johnson. And so they basically said that what they divided your sexual phase into four phases, right? So they say you have this excitement phase and it's like, ooh, the engine's getting revved up. And during that excitement phase, your pelvic floor muscles are supposed to chill out, your vagina tense, you have increased blood flow, lubrication. It's like party, you know? So you're getting ready for that like rave. Right. And then they say, okay, there's a plateau phase. There's supposed to be this plateau phase where you kind of are like, okay, you're aroused, you're aroused, and it's about to come up to the orgasm, and orgasm occurs. And then, of course, resolution after orgasm. Right. So they said that this is what's happening, but there are matched physiological responses at each phase. And so, what they're talking about here is following a normal sexual function or sexual excitement phase, is they're saying that if someone has adequate arousal and excitement, right? That the org, and if the orgasm doesn't follow, then that's where the disorder comes in. Next slide. So here, the International Study Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, ooh, ish switch. Mm -hmm. So they devised this definition. So I really, I really liked how, what they did here is they looked at it, divided it into frequency, intensity, timing, and pleasure. Right. So depending on the patient, right. So if I get a, someone gets referred into my clinic for anorgasmia, right. Lack of orgasm. That's not, that doesn't tell me much, except that there's a problem with orgasm, but I don't know if it's a frequency problem. I don't know if it's an intensity problem. I don't know if it's a timing problem or if it's a pleasure problem. And so when you're looking at that orgasm, you have to look at it in those like four, four factors. And then, and I use this as a way to not only assess my patient, but also get my patient and my, or my client to understand, oh, okay. So like, there are lots of ways that I can look at this, right? It's, it's not just how, you know, it was shown in when Harry met Sally. Ashley, do you have any? No, you're absolutely right. I actually really like the way that's broken down because it does, it does kind of let in on the fact that it's not just, well, it's not, it's not just this unilateral kind of way of thinking and looking at it. And that if you don't, if you're not orgasming, there is, there's the one thing that's wrong or that there's something is to, you know, necessarily to blame versus having all of these that kind of tell a story um, and paint a picture for what's going on. And I, I really like the way they have it broken down. Absolutely. So I put this up here, sorry for the fuzziness. It's, I tried. Um, <laughs> but I put this up here because I wanted you all to see this, you know, algorithm. Um, and there are many out there actually and how it's assessed. And I think it's important to understand like how people look at orgasm dysfunction from like a medical perspective. So when you're, when a person presents to or with orgasm dysfunction, they want to first want to figure out, okay, what is the medical condition? Is there a medical condition present? If there is, then they need to address that medical condition first, right? And that medical condition can be like, you know, hyperthyroidism, it could be, you know, lots of other components or simply just they're going through menopause or they're in a menopausal state, right? And so that needs to be addressed with specific hormone therapy or surgery or whatever needs to happen. But I like here where they kind of take it down to knowledge of anatomy, erogenous yeah. zones, 
oral sex, masturbation, sexual fantasy. Like they're basically saying, and then we're putting them back into sexual education based on what their body is needing and, and behaving as, right? So it's an individualized sex education plan for that patient, right? It's, if the yeah, it's body, foundational. <laughs> right, that's like super foundational. I almost wish that they would like flip it. But at the same time, if there's a medical issue going, they have to address it immediately. But there, there it ends here. And the same thing here. So if we find that the primary cause is more just like a lack of awareness of one's body, they really just haven't had a lot of experience or they're really dealing with a lot of distracting thoughts and just a lot of difficulty concentrating in the sexual space. <laughs> Where does that arrow go? <laughs> right? If there's psychological issues, they're going to address that for sure. But then where does that arrow go? And then of course, psychotherapy and sex therapy. And at the end, we're going to kind of talk about the difference between sex counseling and sex therapy and how that works with physical therapy. All right. So predictors of orgasm dysfunction, everything, literally everything. I didn't have enough space. <laughs> I didn't want to make it too overwhelming, but like all of the things, all of the things. Right? So our meds, our relationships, hormones, pelvic floor dysfunction, focusing on non-erotic thoughts. That's a thing that I really want to make sure that pe people understand that it's not just a woman and non and a vulva owner issue. It's like an everybody issue. Right? I have a lot of patients, penis owners and men who struggle with focusing on those non-erotic thoughts and that can disrupt their erectile dysfunction or their erectile function that can disrupt their orgasm capacity. And so that's one of the things is that if we're seeing that increased issue, then that actually needs to be the, one of the primary interventions. And then of course, let's not forget body image, self-esteem, and then the existence of a chronic illness or a chronic pain condition. All right, so it's time to bust some myths. All right, so <laughs> Samuel Jackson, my homie, my favorite. So he's saying, let there be light. Myth number one, I'm supposed to orgasm at the same time as my partner. This is one of the more distressing things that I see yeah. from my patients is that they're, and it's either coming from themselves that they're putting the expectation on themselves or their partner is putting that expectation on them. Not because their partner is a jerk. <laughs> it's because their partner was educated to think that that's what good sex is supposed to look like. And no one, I think people would rather talk about finances with strangers than talk to their partner about sex. Oh my gosh, that's so true. Would you agree? Absolutely. <laughs> and, and <That's> leak. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, it's, it's really interesting. And I, I think that the biggest, the best solution here to address this myth is to rework your expectations, right? Educating yourself and your boo thing about what, <laughs> what the sexual experience is supposed to look like. I mean, I think we say this a lot and I think people hear this a lot, but I don't think they feel it a lot that the orgasm is not the definition of good sex and that you might experience like maybe a baby orgasm or a medium sized orgasm or not at all, but you're still enjoying yourself. And that's, that actually is a thing. You can have really mind blowing, excellent sex and not necessarily feel that peak orgasm. And so one of the, the practical things I tell people is getting into a practice of doing sexual play with non-genital areas and like really focusing on that like exploration component and then using your sexual recovery because I think oftentimes people don't do that. So they have sexy time, you know, they get it in where they can fit it in. But then there's no, like there's foreplay, there's like, you know, the sexy time that they have. And then they're like, mm, okay, I'm gonna go do the laundry. Mm -mm -mm. Right. And there actually does need to be some type of sexual recovery, right? So after play, right? And that after play actually can really build up your sensation to not, nece to necessarily, not necessarily to have like another sexy time session go, hey, knock yourself out. But it also helps to kind of build that energy for the next time you have sex with your partner. It builds that intimacy and that connection so that you both actually start to become more in sync with one another. So you don't feel so disjointed. Because I understand it can be disruptive if you're having, if your partner's having an orgasm 
you know, 16 seconds into sexy time and you're like 16 minutes later. And so then you feel that pressure to perform or finish quickly. And then of course right. that means that you're like, it's almost like you're, like I taught, like if you guys like a hamster before, wheel. it's yeah, you're like chasing that dog and it's like running away and you're like, come on, come back. Right. And it's, it's really hard to get ahead of it. Ashley, do you, do you have anything? Well, I was going to say, it's almost like that, that recovery is part of you know, the, the foreplay for the next time, even if it isn't just like you were saying, like right away, but it's, it's laying the foundation, the connection, the intimacy, the trust for the next time, even if it's hours or days away, Yeah, it's all part of it. I, I, in, you know, even like, cause, cause that, that foreplay can be so benign, like do your partner does you a favor so it helps you in some way I mean it doesn't it it's all part of the the connection and the 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 building of trust there that is important absolutely and you know I've talked about pleasure mapping before and I have like like literally 20 different ways I write this up for patients but this is one way that I write it up because then it's digestible for people but then we're looking at, you know, oh, this is a way that I'm like really mapping out my pleasure spots. And you don't have, it doesn't necessarily have to be a pleasure spot. It can be a comfort spot. It can be an ease spot. It can be a satisfying spot. Or ooh, this is a zone that kind of, if I engage with this a little bit more, it'll kind of get, get things going for me. It'll kind of rev up my sexy engine. And so pleasure mapping is a great way for you to kind of establish being a little bit more in sync with your partner, right? It could be that you could put this in and use this as a sexual activity. This is a sexual activity. You are mapping out your pleasure. You're exploring one another. So then if you have like a traditional sexy time sesh and then have this, it can kind of take the pressure off, but then it keeps things really interesting, right? And you can be like, oh, okay. I didn't realize that you were into that or I didn't realize you liked that intensity vibration on your ear. Who knew? Now we'll do that next time. Any questions about this? So the next myth, my orgasm should feel the same every time. No, boo boo. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. So <clears throat> the intensity, the length, and the frequency is not a measure of good sex. It is a measure of how you experience your sexual experience, your sexual, your sexy time, right? So like we're using those as markers when we're measuring um, orgasm dysfunction. But I always tell people that if you're seeing a difference in your sexual function, then that's where we're, we're going to see, right? If you're like, I'm normally here, but now, now it's dropped off. That's when we're saying, okay, that's something to be concerned about. That's something to pop into and kind of examine. And so what I tell people here is that if they're saying, oh, my orgasms aren't exciting enough or they're not as intense as they used to be, then seek out other opportunities for different sensations. So I always tell people this, that it's not necessarily that... <clears throat> your partner doesn't have the right tricks. It's just that novelty is important. And we also have to remember that there are all these sensations we have, taste, smell, our sight, touch, you know, sound. All of those things actually need to be like activated, right? Maybe not all at once because everyone's different. And this is where you can take that pleasure mapping to the next level, you know? You can spend some time, like a pressure mapping session can be, okay, like, I'm going to tell you all my little trick, right? I put on some Sade and some John Legend <laughs> and just splice that, right? With a little bit, uh, who's that dude? Tank, he's like this R&B artist and like Keith Sweat. You know, just like get your little, because it gets, because those, for me, you know, that's, that's actually something that helps me chill out. And it may be something that might help me calm down, right? right? If I've had a lit day where I'm like here, I may need to listen to some jazz to like bring my nervous system down so that I can actually receive sexual stimuli in a positive way. Because if I'm here and my partner approaches me with sexual stimuli or trying to get busy and I'm, it's almost like intrusive and it's not them. It's just that where my system is at, but kind of from that auditory standpoint, ah, the jazz, okay. You're kind of do that candle that has that sage and tobacco or whatever. I like that. So then it kind of brings me down a little bit and then that will help me be more responsive during sexual play. Sure. And, and you see, we had a couple of, oh, we, I was just saying, we had a couple of questions around um, like the different kinds, like the 
I, am I feeling a clitoral orgasm or a deep vaginal or like a cervical orgasm? Um, I guess like, how do you, what's your thoughts on, do those exist? Like, what are the, yeah. what does that look like? So is that, is that the question? Sorry, I can't see the question. So, oh no, the, this was a question ahead of time, but it just, it felt right for this part, which was like, it, what's, is there a difference between clitoral and deep vaginal orgasms? Are they all possible? Is a cervical all, orgasm a real thing? It, yeah, they're all real thing. They're all a real thing, right? They are. It's just a matter of how you access it, right? And the, the thing about it is when, I, I think sometimes what I try to get people to understand is that you can access your orgasms many ways, anal, cervical, clitoral, nipple, <laughs> all types, all parts of your body. It's like fair game. Right. You can sensitize all parts of your body for that orgasm experience. And so it's definitely possible, right? It's just a matter of if you're chasing that, then it might run away from you. So I always tell people, let's explore, you know, if you're looking for cervical orgasm, let's explore deeper penetration right? Let's use a toy. If your partner is endowed, use like kind of use deeper thrusts. And I'm going to show, I think I'm going to show that next actually. Um, things like that, you know, lots of ways to kind of frame it. So then it's like, Ooh, this is a new experience. Ooh, I'm actually enjoying this. Oh, and then let's use that technique that we found last week with our pleasure mapping. Ooh, okay. And like, let's turn up that Sade song. Cause I really like that. And then you're kind of working, you're going up that roller coaster right? You're going up the roller coaster. And then once you're there, you're going to maintain. And we're going to talk about that too, um, a little bit, in a few moments. Was there another question? Did I answer that? No, I think you answered that. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, can you go back? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so pelvic floor coordination training. So, and I say pelvic floor coordination training because I don't say strengthening because not everybody needs to be strengthened. Um, it depends on what's going on with the pelvic floor, but not only what's going on with the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, the sacrum, we actually do have to do a full assessment to make sure that they're all working in tandem and your diaphragm. So for some people, we do need to strengthen and that will actually help in terms of like what they're feeling and experiencing. But then we may need to focus on relaxation and being able to release that pelvic floor. And then of course, positioning is your friend. So in the next slide. So in this study done by um, Hensel, Von Hippel, Lepage, and Perkins, they were talking about different techniques to make vaginal penetration more pleasurable. And so what I found was really interesting about this is they, these are pretty common techniques, but they kind of put this into a perspective that I appreciate. So it's not just for people who are having um, sex with men, but it's for people who are having sex with women and using strap-ons or dildos or toys. And so these techniques can be really, really helpful in terms of angling in particular. So in here in this position, you see how the, you, have the pen, you have the penis in or the toy in, and during penetration, the woman or the vulva owner is going to be arching their back back and forth. So you're going to see that kind of massaging that deep vaginal tissues and getting close to that cervical area. And so that's one of the things that people may like, particularly if you're a person who has some pain and the friction of the in and out is distracting, this might actually be a very nice alternative. Another option is going to be the rocking. So this is where the base of the penis or toy is gonna to be rubbing up against the clitoris, right? Constantly during penetration. So the, almost the pelvic bones are gonna align, right? And so they're all gonna stay inside. So instead of kind of the vagina, instead of things thrusting in and out of the vagina, you're gonna have this like rocking sensation back and forth. And it's kind of like what you were saying, this is, as you can kind of see in these, just from these, these descriptions here, why the entire body is important. The thoracic spine, the low back, and that everything is in, is working in tandem. Because if it's not just your sex organs, your pelvic floor muscles, you can see, you know, even just from these, these um, positions, pain can be, you know, can occur from above, from higher right. up the chain. Right. And even if, it's, if, even if there's no pain, right? If someone has a really, really stiff lumbar spine, right? And their thoracic spine, their low back is like, doesn't really move that well. They, it's, they're going to have a hard time getting into this angling position. Right. And they might have a harder time recruiting their pelvic floor or de-recruiting their pelvic floor. Yeah, we had a question um, that was around 
someone had a friend who orgasms every time she does a Kegel. Um, and they were wondering if that's something that, you know, you can turn on and off or how to tap into that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> I don't mean, I was like, man, I mean, I need to talk to your friend. Dang. Yeah, seriously. You know? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know what's happening in that phenomenon. I will say that is not common. I'm not saying that that's abnormal, but I, that's definitely not common. Um, I think when it comes to your friend, it either could be that their tissues are really, like they may just have really good compression against some of the nerves that help in terms of sens sensation of pleasure. They might actually have a little bit higher tone, which might actually kind of perpetuate something like kind of a persistent, like a genital arousal sensitivity that, can, that does happen. So that can be explained um, without evaluating them or talking to them or knowing their history. That could be one reason why they're hap why that's happening. I mean, I don't really, co I don't, I've never coached someone to have an orgasm with the activity of one Kegel. Um, I have coached people to improve their orgasm experience with strengthening their pelvic floor. So yes, you know, we can all do that. And that would require us first evaluating your pelvic floor to make it, to make it most effective. You know, you would need someone to evaluate not just your pelvic floor, but your whole body and posture and how everything moves. And then we can give you a program that actually works. And oftentimes I tell people, give it like two to three months. And then in those two to three months, can continue to explore and revamp your sex life and how you approach it. And you'll find that you'll just stumble upon orgasms that are, you have deeper satisfaction and, and happiness with. Ashley, do you have anything to add? Have well, you? yeah, I was going to say, and, and sometimes that can lead to pain, right? That pers persistent general arousal can yeah. lead to pain. And obviously that wouldn't be a normal symptom to be experiencing. And while um, maybe it can be looked on as let's strive for, you know, orgasm with every Kegel, but if there is a pain occurring in that, there is help that can be provided for that as well. And it's certainly something that it deserves attention. Yeah. Now it's different now if they're engaging in sexual activity and they're saying during sexual activity, every time I Kegel, it just like takes me over the, over, over the cliff. That's great. And that's awesome. And yeah. I don't know if that's what they meant or if they meant I'm just walking down the street and I <laughs> just and do one like, Kegel and there I go. Yeah. You know, um, you know, which is great. But both them. are important. Yeah. 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 Both are important for sure. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> but then sometimes orgasms can be distressful, can be yeah. distressing for people. Um, especially if it happens at a moment where they don't want it to happen. And so then it's really an orgasm, but it's not associated with pleasure. Um, so here obviously is pairing that I, we've all you know, seen before, but I think that's really important to know here. You can do pairing a couple of ways. You could do pairing where you're maintaining the toy or penis inside the vagina and you're just massaging the clitoris or the pubic bones here, or the pubic uh, symphysis up here. And sometimes that pressure alone can be enough. There can be massaging of the vulva to get to the legs of the clitoris. Um, you could use hand, finger, you can use fingers, you could use dilators, you could use um, vibrators, all of the above. Yeah, this is actually a great, uh, we had a question that was, um, she had read, one woman had read that orgasms via penetration are actually caused by stimulation of the clitoris from the inside. And so she was like, is that legit? Or is that just total hogwash? <laughs> Well, I think that that's still up for debate. So some studies will say, yes, through stimulation of the clitoris from the inside. Some people say it's really activation of the pelvic nerves and pelvic muscles inside of the, inside of the vagina. Some people say it's cervical activation. So I think it really just depends on the individual and your anatomy, because believe it or not, everyone's vagina is, a, is very different. Jury's still how, out. Yeah, the jury's still out. But I always tell people that the achievement of an orgasm via vaginal penetration or the achievement of an orgasm with non-vaginal penetration, it's really not how you get it. It's more just, is it pleasurable? Do you enjoy it? And is it happening in a frequency that you, that works for you? Yeah. And so shallowing is really just for people who also don't really want to have deeper penetration. So shallowing is another great option to kind of enhance different sensation and pleasure. Okay. I'm supposed to have multiple orgasms every time. No. <laughs> I mean, it happens for a lot, for a good number of people, but not everyone can have multiple. 
depending on what's going on in your body. And I know this sounds like I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record, but it's actually true. You know, some of my patients, because of what they're going through, they might be going through cancer treatment, they have chronic back issues, they have chronic thyroid issues, they have autoimmune disorder. They're not, they're not, their bodies is not in a space to have multiples, but some people are. And so here, when we're thinking about how does one achieve multiple orgasms? So I always think about the concept of recovery, right? So recovery is going to be that phase after you have that orgasm and everything's kind of coming back down, right? And so here you want to be mindful that the clitoris is really sensitive. And what you can do is you can actually cup the vulva with your hands and breathe into that space. And you can, and I, when I say hit the replay, that's the palm technique. And when I say hit the replay button is going back to some of the tech sensations during the sexy time session you just had and having your partner repeat that that's non-genital, right? Because you need the tissues to recover. And then you kind of, let's say, let's say you like your ears to be kind of massaged. So then your partner might slowly massage your ears while you're kind of holding, holding on to your perineum. And then your partner might be kissing you. And then you may say, oh, okay, I'm recovering. And then you might focus on non, non, you know, vagina, vulva parts. And then you can go back into that space as your body recovers. Sometimes people can really, this is really, really helpful and it can achieve them to have multiple, multiple sessions and thus achieving multiple orgasms. And then they can keep that train going. And then sometimes people are like, you know what? I'm good. I'm really good. I'm fine here. And then also utilizing that pleasure maps that we started from myth one and kind of carrying that through. You know, right? it's funny. We had a question around like, um, it had, you know, I don't multiply, I don't orgasm multiple times. Like why biologically? And to your point, it's like, we've been told that like the biological is the one small piece, but it's so much more complex. Right. Yeah. It's pretty complex. And so for some people, it might be that their pelvic floor is still active. Right. And so they're seeing still having pelvic floor contractions that are actually lasting longer. So they're still kind of continuing in that pelvic floor in that orgasm space. They might actually have pelvic congestion. So like the blood flow mm -hmm. is still kind of trapped. And with those muscle contractions, contractions is maintaining that sensation of having that multiple orgasms. Some people, when they are reaching an orgasm, their partner might actually continue to do what they're doing. And then they might recover. They have this acute recovery and then they shoot back up. So if you want to see if you can experience that or explore that more, have your partner continue through your orgasm. And you're gonna, what you're gonna have to do is kind of release but then kind of release your muscle tension, but then build it back up, you know, very sharply. So, right, it's like, you're almost gonna kind of take a breath and then tense back up again. Cool. They answer that question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Orgasms, myth number four, orgasms are better with squirting. That would be a hard no. <laughs> That'd be hard. I mean, there are two different sensations, two different sensations. So, you know, the squirting sensation is not an orgasm. An orgasm is not squirting. Um, two separate things. They can occur together, but I think it, the study said, recent study said it was about 20%, 20, 20 25% of people um, who squirt have an orgasm at the same time. And we had a question is, can everyone have a squirting orgasm? I think the body can, but if you don't, if you don't experience it, it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or that you're not tapping into your sexual energy. I think one of the things that's really important is that you really, one thing is that you really do have to be in that moment. You really have to be relaxed in your body. And then if you're partnered, you really have to be comfortable in that space with your partner. You know, those are some of the common things that they've said in research that can, has occurred with people. So the roller coaster technique um, is kind of what I started to talk about earlier in terms of kind of the buildup. So you want to kind of ramp, see, Oops. you want to <laughs> <laughs> preview. <laughs> um, you want to ramp things up. So let's, for example, like, I'll just say, like, I'm starting with my wrist here. Right. And so like, it's like, okay, like, Engines, engines is being revved up. And then you may want to go faster or slower, just depending on what you like. And the feed, this is why pleasure mapping is important. So if you're like, oh, I love faster, I love pressure, I love firmer, or I love deeper pressure, then your partner needs to do that. And they need to do that as you're building that up. And then they have to maintain it. 
they have to maintain that through orgasm. And then what you have to do is like, once you hit that apex, you're going to release and like really release. It's almost like you're gonna take this like visceral sigh, like from your hair follicles to your toes, right? And squirting is not pee. <laughs> okay, so that's the technique, the build up, maintain the build, unclench. But number one, be comfortable, be in the moment. If you stress, if you stress in, and you've never, if you've never achieved, if you've never squirted before and you're looking to explore that more, but if you're like kind of walking into that sexy space, like not feeling it, it's going to be a lot harder to get into that. And you're not better because of it. I think that it gets in no. people's heads as well. Exactly. Exactly. Like squirting is just something that some people experience and some people don't experience. And if it's something you're like, oh, I'm interested. I want to learn more about it. I want to see what my body, you know, I want to explore my body more. That's fine. But if you're like, no, I don't squirt. And I need to do that because that's affirmation that my partner is doing their job. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Which leads to your next myth. Yes. My partner gives me the best orgasm. Nope. Absolutely not. No one gives you an orgasm. I know that sounds ridiculous, but hear me out because they're not gift cards. They're not just gift cards that are bestowed upon the blessed few who have the <laughs> gift of giving you orgasms. It's like, okay, they have like 50 orgasm cards and they're giving it to you. It's really, the orgasm can be, it's a combination of emotional and physical comfort, autonomy, skill. Yes, skill matters. Your mindset, the motivation for engaging in sex with your partner right? Because your motivation might be, I'm stressed. The motivation might be, I love you so much. The motivation is I need an orgasm or, you know, or I'm bored, right? There are lots of right. reasons why we engage in sex. And so when we're thinking about orgasms, they're not gifts bestowed upon us from our partner, but they're, they're experiences that you can experience, that you can have with your partner, with and without your partner. But I've said this many times, you know, that your sexuality is yours. There's your sexuality and your partner has their own sexuality. And then you have one together as a couple or as a group or how, how your relationship structure is. And so going into orgasms, thinking that your partner gives them to you or your partner saying, oh, I'm going to give you the best orgasm. Be like, oh, well, we're going to have a good time. <laughs> And we're going to see what happens because I'm really excited to have sexy time with you because you are a snack to me. Right. Okay. So James Baldwin, uh, my favorite writer of all times, he said, to be sensual, I think, is to respect and rejoice in the force of life, of life itself, and to be present in all that one does, from the effort of loving to the making of bread. So what are the next steps? How are we doing on time? Okay, I'm gonna quickly go through this. So I just wanna clarify. So a sex counselor is someone like Ashley and myself, a nurse, it can be a MD, it can be a clergyman, it can be like anyone in healthcare space, but they are not mental health providers, right? They help you in terms of figuring out specific suggestions. They can help you kind of give you permission to kind of discuss these problems, build it out in a framework for you. They're going to give you accurate information. They're kind of basically they're coaching you into a better sex life, right? But they're not going to go into the deep psychological piece. Next slide. A sex therapist is a licensed mental health provider. Okay, so they're doing in-depth psychotherapy and then they've got an extra training to treat the sexual issues and concerns. So for example, like I might have a patient that comes in with anorgasmia, but they've had a significant history of anxiety, right? I may, I'm gonna send them to a therapist, but I first need to figure out, is it more about anxiety related to sex or is it that they have general anxiety and sex just happens to be kind of the victim of that? Right. And so if I find that it's sex related, if it's anxiety related to sex, I'm going to send them to a sex counselor who specializes in anxiety. But if they have like generalized anxiety disorder and all these issues, I'm going to send them to a counselor that that focuses on generalized anxiety disorder. Does that make sense? So it really has to make we have to make sure that it's not all one size fits all. 
It's more, we really have to think about what's going into the issues and then make the appropriate referral from there. So this is a model where you delineate between a sex counselor and a therapist. So a sex therapist is all of this, whereas a sex counselor is going to stop here. Okay, but they're not going to do the intensive therapy just to put that out there. So here's my suggestion. <laughs> right. So do some, some foundational work, right? Name the issue. What's motivating you to get this addressed? Is it your inter own internal clock or self, or is it uh, external factors, right? What distracts you during sex? What are the positive distractors or the negative distractors? Create your own biopsychosocial model, right? Make one. Just write out the factors, like what's happening biologically, psychologically, sociocultural, interpersonal. That way you've kind of done that work. And then once you see a medical provider, you can be like, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, and then it can help you. And then they're like, okay, cool. You know what? Let's, let's take a closer look at this and then see how that dress. And I see you have these issues too. So I'm going to make this referral. So then it's like, then it's, a, it's much more efficient for you and you get the care that you need, you know? And then of course they're going to screen you for medical issues, but pending your results, you're going to start to build your sexy time dream team. And I talk about this all the time that like, you gotta have it. Right? Like, do you need a yoga therapist? Do you need a Reiki person? Do you need a sex therapist? Do you need a trauma therapist? Do you need a urogynecologist? PT faux show. You know? <laughs> Always. Always. Right? Next slide. Oh, I love Eartha Kit. Anyway, so. <laughs> what a goddess. I know. Um, so, pelvic physical therapy. So, when I talk to my patients, you know, sometimes you know, we give them the traditional treatment of dilators, all of that. But a lot of times I really focus on mindfulness activities, right? And like, what gets you mindful in that space, right? Quieting your nervous system, because that's also like one of the perfect things to, to address orgasm issues. And then also I didn't put here getting you pooping. So if you're like constipated, uh -huh. there's nothing less sexy than like a rectum full of stool right? Absolutely. Yeah. No, and like, the tension that can recur because yeah. of that. And the bloating and it like totally disrupts your sexy swag. And you're like, oh, you know, I feel <laughs> and really pain. aware of it. <laughs> and you're just not, you know, so that's another thing using that pleasure mapping. So I intersplice pleasure mapping and pain mapping and comfort mapping, right? Like what makes someone comfortable if they not, may not be in a space to think about pleasure. you like, what feels comfortable to you? Sorry. Reply. And then external factors, right? Making sure that we understand what those external factors are and keep them present, you know? So to say, okay, like my work environment is shit show, excuse my language, but like it's a mess, but like, or I'm going through, <laughs> I'm in a grad program or my kid is really struggling in school and that's stressing me out or I don't have enough childcare. And then of course, making sure that your PT collaborates with their other dream team members. Okay, so time for questions. Great. I know we had some, actually, this was so topical because one of the questions we had was um, around how does public floor influence constipation? It's like they, they knew oh, you were going to touch on it. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley, do you want to take this one? <laughs> well, I mean, in so many different ways, if you're talking about, you know, our muscles can hold in our stool. If, we're, if those muscles aren't working well, we're talking about the pelvic floor muscle coordination. There needs to be a, a good balance in that muscle's length. The muscle shouldn't be too long and unhelpful and weak. And also it shouldn't be too tight and overactive. And a lot of times what can happen is if that muscle has a hard time relaxing and opening in order to empty out stool, then it's almost like you're kind of pushing against uh, like a toothpaste tube with the lid on where your muscle, your, you know, your intraabdominal, you're pushing, your intraabdominal pressure is pushing, your intestines are pushing, but those muscles aren't relaxing, then you can't get the stool out. And over time, then that can complicate how that rectum is responsive. It can become over baggy and um, not as responsive. You may not sense that you have as much stool in there. And that can just kind of complicate the whole picture as well. Um, so, you know, we get, we need to get those muscles coordinated so that they are relaxing when you're trying to, but also have improve their length so that there isn't as much tension and pain there to begin with. 
and to allow for, for emptying. Beyond that, you know, dietary components, stress can slow down the gut, all sorts of things, which plays back into the picture of what could be complicating orgasm sexual function. Yeah. We had, um, we had a question about a, a woman who has a partner who is too large. And so like, should she give up? Um, she's been using dilators to try to work on that, but, um, and has torn a few times. So like, how, how can she think about that? Absolutely. So I think that one, one of the things, the shallowing technique, I think is actually very helpful for people whose partners are really largely endowed. And depending on the situation, I don't know if it's a girth issue or a length issue. If it's a length issue, ONA is excellent for, um, ONA is excellent for, sorry, I, I just saw this. It's a girth issue, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Onet is excellent for length issues. In terms of girth, it may not be as helpful. So I think shallowing can be very helpful. Another thing that you may want to consider, I don't know your makeup, but like kind of consulting with your PT and your um, referring provider. So I don't know if it was gynecologist, urology, colorectal, whatever, but seeing if they think it's necessary, if they're going to evaluate and see if it's necessary, maybe to kind of get some lidocaine to help you with some of the larger dilators to kind of help with the stretch so that it minimizes that pain response. But if you're tearing, that may also be an issue of atrophy. And so you may need some topical estrogen, but again, that will require your doctor or your nurse practitioner, PA, um, nurse midwife to assess you um, to make sure that that's an appropriate thing path to go down. Um, but I mean, you can try O-Nut to kind of help in terms of that shallowing piece as well. And she was just wondering how long would that take like with some of those solutions you mentioned? Yeah, so you, it takes some time. So I would say like, I would start off, give yourself like a three month block if you're doing it consistently, like, you know, three times a week and kind of really practicing that technique and slowing down. And oftentimes when your partner is largely endowed, having them stage the penetration. So it might be that you can say, okay, you're gonna go in a little bit and you breathe and you can do external stuff and it can still be pleasurable and you can do the shallowing thing. And then over time, you kind of slowly get internal. But I think that I would also frame for your partner that that's one avenue to express, because I know that you really want to experience that penetrative intercourse, so I'm not minimizing that. But then while you're working on getting to that piece and exploring that, then you can also explore those other measures that can be really, really um, exciting and pleasurable. Awesome. And we had a, another uh, person who asked, if how, how can you tell if you're not relaxed? How can you tell if you're not relaxed? Yeah, and I don't know if that means from the pelvic floor or physically or uh, mentally, but uh, maybe we just start with the pelvic floor. <laughs> I think that popped up when I was when I was talking about that pelvic floor not relaxing for constipation. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what they're referring to. Um, All of the above. <laughs> for sure. I think certainly a, 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 a sign that there might be, you know, you're having a harder time relaxing that muscle. Well, one, I mean, are you, do you find yourself like holding your breath and bracing? Um, when we're not using that diaphragm and um, releasing muscle, um, releasing the muscles in our abdominals and in the diaphragm, then, you know, that might indicate that maybe those pelvic floor muscles are holding tension as well. Or if certainly if there's pain, that might be a, a, a symptom of those muscles not relaxing. So that pain can come from poor blood flow, irritated nerves, muscle cramping, trigger points in there. Um, and, and, and certainly isn't normal to have pain during intercourse. Another way to understand if you're not relaxing and there's, there's a non-intercourse way and there's an intercourse way. The non-intercourse way is similar to what Ashley was saying, constipation, but also like, are you power peeing? Like, are you pushing to pee, mm. right? Does it take you a while to like let the urine come out? That's a sign that your pelvic floor is a little tight. During sexy time, if you're not really, yeah. So like, if you're like having to power pee and you're like <sighs> to push, like you shouldn't be doing that when you pee. You shouldn't be doing that when you pee right. by them. But you know, everyone's a constipated, I get it. But so that's one sign that your pelvic floor is not, releasing the way that it should. Another sign during sex that you're not like relaxing is if you can't quite get physically comfortable. And sometimes that's because like your back is not happy with you, not necessarily pain, but you're just like, oh, I'm not physically comfortable, right? So your pelvic floor is gonna react by just being like this. So you can't, and it may not feel tight, but you may feel like oh, I'm just not feeling the same, right? And so I always tell people like, if you're kind of in that space during sexy time, then 
you should get on like hands and knees, get into child's pose, breathe or do some breath partner breathing with your partner, have them kind of revert to like massaging the inner thighs, the back, kind of getting you back down and then re restarting again. Amazing. Um, I know maybe we just have time for uh, one more question and then we'll wrap it up. But um, any, any, I guess, resources you all would recommend for dyspareunia or like coping with, um, with dyspareunia or pain with sex? Yeah, so um, some of the things that I like is my PFM, my pelvic floor muscles, that nonprofit organization is amazing and they have a ton, a ton of resources for people coping with pain with sex. Um, ONUT, they have a great resource as well. Um, there, if you go online, they have a ton of like online learning and coping strategies that I think are fantabulous. Um, gosh, I mean, now, okay, yes, OMG, yes, that's a great website. Oh, that's my favorite. I love <laughs> OMG. I love it. <laughs> yes. and those, that was created by um, researchers from University of Indiana at the Kinsey Institute, which is one of the leading institutions in the U.S. for sexual re sexual health resource. So it's it's completely legit embedded with academic rigor. Um, ONUT O H N U T ONUT.com. I think right. Yeah. ONUT. Yeah. ONUT. Yeah. yeah, and OMGS, um, which is yeah. ONUT is like. I gave that to all of my all of the women in my uh, family. I gave OMGS <laughs> yeah. for Christmas Very last year. <laughs> yeah. Good job. And then also, and then also like seeking out. Um, working with like a sex counselor or a sex therapist can actually be helpful in terms of getting it, giving you some support and framing things. I don't know of any large scale 